Praise the Lord. Amen. Greetings to you, brothers and sisters, in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I bring you love and greetings from India, from the church in my hometown. Before coming to Brisbane, I knew only one family who are meeting with you, that is Brother Joseph and Tenny and little Debbie. I had talked to Brother Sam over phone, that also very recently. I believe it was the Lord in his mercy who permitted me to come here and have sweet fellowship with you. Amen. And uh, my confidence is primarily that you are continuing to pray for me. And there is a family, a church family back in India who are right now praying for me for this camp. Praise God. I was really encouraged to listen to these two or three sisters, and brother, Sister Martha and the other brother. And uh, Sister Martha was telling about prayer. And that too, prayer for today, for the present. See, someone has told, yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery in some way. Today, today is a gift from God. That's why it's called the present. It's a gift from God. Hallelujah. And there are people who are of the Epicurean school of thought who also say something similar. In one of the old poems, I have read years before, it's like this. Unborn tomorrows, dead yesterday. Why fret about the morrow if today be sweet? We Christians do not hold that view because our interest, our seeking is not just to make today sweet, uh, joyful, wonderful, at the cost of a blessed future. But at the same time, we need to live in the presence of God in the present, every day, every day. As uh, this dear brother was sharing a couple of verses from Matthew 11, the Lord confirmed to me tonight that the burden that he had given to me to share in this opening session was exactly the same thing which I had in my mind because the Lord told me to speak about revelation. Removing the veil, opening our inner eyes. I'm not going to dwell too long on that uh, subject right now, but as we read in Matthew 11, the closing verses, Jesus, our Lord, is praising his heavenly Father, telling, Oh, Father, I praise you because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed it to babes, to infants, revealed. Revealing is something which is very much there behind the curtain, but the curtain, the veil is removed and we see. That is something which only the Holy Spirit can do, even today. So, dear brothers and sisters, it is more going to be a time of uh, sharing together encouraging one another. I'm not a great Bible teacher or a great preacher for that matter, but my joy is that the Lord met with me when I was at almost, uh, my, when my teenage was over, you know, when I was 18, I met the Lord. In fact, the Lord met with me, and ever since my life has changed, there had been ups and downs, but in His mercy, as we sang, amazing grace has led me so far 
And I'm sure this grace will take me home. Hallelujah. That is the confidence that every Christian has. So I would call upon you, dear ones who know the Lord, who love the Lord, to magnify the Lord with me. Hallelujah. The psalmist says, Oh, all the faithful ones, come and magnify the Lord with me. Ascribe greatness to the Lord. What does these verses mean? Once a young boy asked his father, I don't know whether any of your children have asked me this question. This boy asked his dad, Dad, how big is God? How big is God? The father was a little, you know, short how to answer this question. <laughs> so then a thought came to his, they were standing in the open and from the airport, a plane had a mood a little high and there was a plane, an aeroplane flying. So he pointed to the aeroplane, which was flying up in the air, far away, and asked him, how big is that plane? This little boy told, tiny, very small, very small. I can hardly see that. Okay, so after some hours, he took him to the nearby airport and took him very close to a gigantic, a very big plane. And then he asked him, how big is an aeroplane? The boy said, oh, I can't believe that. A plane is so big. Then his dad told him, this very same plane you saw some time back. And you told it's so small. So what does it mean when the psalmist calls upon us to magnify the Lord? See, when you see a star, with a very powerful telescope, you don't make that star any bigger. It is as big as it is. But to our naked eyes, it's a teeny weeny small twinkling little star. But with the help of a telescope, uh, with a very powerful telescope, you see it magnified thousands of times, magnified. So in the same way, with the telescope of faith, your living faith, and with the help of the Holy Spirit. These days and in the coming days, we together are going to magnify the Lord, see Him much, much bigger than we were seeing Him in the past. And uh, only the telescope of faith, trusting the Lord, believing in His Word, alone can help us to see the Lord as he's not exactly because we, we will be growing day by day, seeing him greater and more glorious, more loving, more compassionate. This is a never ending process. Praise the Lord. I am a pilgrim with you in this journey. So, therefore, let us glorify and magnify the Lord. By that, what we mean is by ascribing glory to him and lifting up his name and uh, praising him and wondering at all that he is doing and what he has done. I am not making God greater or bigger in any way. But to me, my little heart, he is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, a never-ending process. Hallelujah. And if the Lord in his mercy opens our inner eye and opens our inner ears to see and hear him, we will be blessed. Praise the Lord. And I would like to read a, a text uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, which is very familiar to most of you, I believe. Uh, that is 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I read from the beginning. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Hallelujah. 
Paul determined to know nothing. Not that he knew nothing else. He was ignorant. He had probably much more knowledge and uh, information learning than almost all of us. But then he says, I, this was my determination, my decision, that when I am among you, I will know nothing else except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Hallelujah. It was Charles Spurgeon the prince of preachers who said to tell about Jesus without the cross to tell about Jesus without the cross is to betray him with a kiss see nowadays we hear a lot of things being preached about Jesus but this man of God knew that to preach Jesus minus his cross is to betray him because it's cross, it's the cross that has really made us free. Hallelujah. But for the cross, but for many, it's only a symbol. But for us, those who believe, the cross of Christ is the way to eternal life, the way of salvation, the way of liberty, the way of freedom. I know the cross in olden days, the cross on which our Lord died for our sins, was not just the cross that we see, the picture that we see now. But nevertheless, one thing all will agree, the cross as an instrument of cruel punishment and death had two wooden planks. Am I right? With one plank, you will never make a cross. Whether it is, usually what I understand, to the best of my knowledge, is that cross was like a T. It was not like this. It was a T. But whatever it is, a single vertical plank will make only a pole. It's not a cross. And the horizontal plank completes it. And a horizontal wooden plank alone will not make a cross. I'm sure you will agree with me. So when we, whenever we think of the cross, we must think about the instrument of God that brought us into fellowship with the Heavenly Father. When God became my Father, it was through the cross. It was at the cross I met my Savior. So that vertical relationship with God, the Father, was established by this vertical, that's a symbol of my getting reconciled to God. As Romans 5 says, by faith, by faith, we have been reconciled to God. We have become children of God, sons and daughters. But to some people, at least, the whole story ends there. They claim, they say that they have been reconciled to God. God's wrath, the anger has been removed all through. But at the same time, there is no horizontal relationship with those whom the Lord has saved. So what I am trying to convey is, unless this horizontal plank is also there in my, uh, my life, my thinking, that's fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Christ, anywhere in the world. See, I can tell you very frankly, though, I am seeing almost all of you the first time in my life. I don't have any mental barrier. I don't have any walls in between. Why? We are of so different cultures, skin color, languages, upbringing. I don't know what. All different. But Sam was in a lighter tone telling the day before yesterday, uh, our church is United Nations, you know, different people from different <laughs> nationalities all coming together. Why no barriers? Is it because I am that great a man with that great uh, larger heart? No. Because we see in the word of God that Christ, Jesus Christ on the cross, he tore down, he pulled down all the barriers, all the walls that separated us 
and in the love of God has brought us together, made us into one. And that wonderful work is continuing. And praise God for that. Hallelujah. So, in the very beginning, the first hour itself, I would like to share with you uh, just three things which Romans 8 tells us. I know most of you are familiar with Romans 8 before coming to this text that we have read. As a prelude to that, I would say, there are so many things. In fact, many theologians call this Romans chapter 8 as the, the most glorious chapter in the whole of Bible. Some may differ, but in Romans 8, you can find so many precious divine truths. But just three things which we should always remember, which I try to remember. I'll just mention that without going into all the details. What's the first two words of Romans 8? Romans 8, 1. Now, therefore, there is no condemnation. Hallelujah. Condemnation and the conviction of sin are two different things. It's sad that many believers confuse between these two. They think these are same, you know, two words with same meaning. No. Condemnation, you see, someone who has murdered somebody, killed somebody, tried in a court, and condemned for death penalty, waiting his, uh, waiting uh, him to be hanged or uh, um, put in an electric chair or something. You know, someone who is condemned, condemned, found guilty and uh, awaiting the punishment, which is a just punishment. So, what the Lord tells us in verse 1 is, now therefore, because there are certain things which are mentioned before that, we are not going into that now, but the first thing that actually should be settled in all of our hearts is, if we know the Lord, if the Lord has saved us, if we are in Christ Jesus, because that's the only thing that is mentioned in that verse. Now, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So the question today evening is, dear brother, sister, young and old, are you in Christ? Are you in Christ Jesus? Do you believe? Are you, are you sure that God has put you in Christ? When Jesus was hanging on that tree, that accursed tree, the cross, God had put you and me in Christ. We were in Christ. We died with him. That's what God's word says. So if you are in Christ Jesus, there is no place for a spirit of condemnation. Hallelujah. And those who have come to that position must always hold on to that. I'm sure the devil will try his level best to bring charges against you. Remind you about your past very often. Am I right? For some, occasionally, when they do fall, to some, it's a continuous thing. You know, things that, that trouble them most of the time because they think, oh, my sins are so great, so horrible that God cannot just forgive me like that. <laughs> yes, God has not just forgiven you and me like that. He had to give his precious son. He has to turn his face away in his, in his holy anger towards sin, his hatred for sin, that he had to give his son, as we read in John 3.16. God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. That was the price God the Father gave. It was not just forgiving, but once the great price has been paid, and the Lord has opened our mind's eye to see that Jesus died for me in my place on the cross. He took the penalty of my sin, my curse, my punishment was laid upon him. When 
I take that. When I take that position and say, Father, I accept. I want to come to you behind the Lord Jesus Christ, your son who has become righteousness for my sake. That's why a very cruel slave trader like John Newton could, after he found amazing grace, pen those lines which we sang sometime back. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That grace is our stronghold. Praise God. So there is no condemnation. And we should never allow anyone else, Satan, and different situations to bring in that spirit of condemnation inside us, thinking that I am, I am not a beloved child of God. I cannot, I need to do something. I need to do something to earn his favor. I cannot just be forgiven like that. That's not from God. God says that my son's righteousness is enough for you. Nothing more. You need never bring anything else. Anything else added to the righteousness of Christ is an abomination to God because we are belittling the Son of God. We are saying that the, death, the precious blood of Jesus is not good enough. Is not good enough to wash my sins, to cleanse me. I need to add something more to that. See, uh, some of you might have read uh, Micah, the book of Micah 7.19. You need not read that. There is a God, even in the Old Testament days. He has written through prophet Micah about the days to come. That is the days of grace in which we are living. That means I will put, I will remember your sins no more. I will cast them into the depth of the sea. To the depth of the sea, I will cast your sins. See, once, uh, I think most of you would have heard about a godly woman called the Corrie Ten Boom. She suffered a lot in the Nazi camp. She was not a Jew, a German, because her parents hit so many Jews during these uh, difficult times. She and her sister died in the camp and Corrie and Boom once told, God takes our sins, past, present, and even future, and dumps them into the depths of the sea. You get me? She told God takes our sins, past, present, and even future sins, and cast them into the depth of the sea. And then he puts a signboard there. No fishing allowed here. You get my point? <laughs> Devil is Satan is an expert in prompting us to fish there, you know. Pick out something. Pick out something which the Lord has put into the depth of the sea and be troubled. Do not come to rest. Be always restless. When we sin, we need to be restless. But that can last only for a moment. If the Spirit convicts you of something which is against the great love of God, immediately what I want to do is to confess my sin, never to justify myself, and ask the Lord, cleanse me in the precious blood of Jesus. Father, I'm so sorry, I'm so sad. I repent, I deeply repent, and that moment, the blood of Jesus cleanses me of any sin. Not that we want to sin, but if we fall into a sin, we can be rid of that in a fraction of a second even. We did not carry it over for another day. We can immediately be cleansed. So that's the first thing. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So tonight, if any one of you are not sure that you are in Christ Jesus, I would encourage you, come to the Lord in faith like an infant, as we read in Matthew 11. This is being revealed to infants, to babies, those who believe like little children, you know. Little children up to a particular age, 
they don't use much of their logic or common sense or anything. They just believe what their dad and mom say. I've seen when my uh, children were young, even if you ask them to jump from the terrace, you're standing below and they will jump because they know their father's hands are below. And they don't think that in case my dad makes a slip and I fall down, I will break my head, nothing of that sort. It's just implicit faith, trust. So if we can trust God like that, do you think that he is going to let us down? So if you are not sure that you are in Christ Jesus, then I would encourage and pray that the Lord opens your eyes to see that there is one who has died for you on the cross and you can be pardoned, you can become a child of God by receiving Jesus in faith, by coming to him as a repentant sinner. And I'm sure the Lord is the one who gives us repentance. He only can do that. He only can give faith also for that. Praise the Lord. So, if we are in Christ Jesus, there is no need for any condemnation. As I said in the beginning, there definitely will be conviction of sin. Because by the Holy Spirit, I have been born again. I have come to the kingdom of God. And that, that same Spirit will convict me of anything unchristlike. Sin has only one definition as far as I am concerned. Anything short of the glory of God. That's what Romans says. All men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means the standard, the perfect standard of God. And that is Christ Jesus as he came in our flesh. So a mind that is even a little deviant, different from the mind of Christ, that is sin. When we start seeing sin like that, I'm sure many a times, even on a single day, we have reasons to repent. And because the Spirit convicts us immediately. And conviction is different from condemnation, but there is no need for condemnation. I repeat, there, now therefore there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Because the law of life in Christ Jesus has set us free. Praise the Lord. Free from condemnation. That's the first thing that should be settled in our heart. The second thing that we see in that chapter, there are so many precious divine truths as I told in this chapter. And I think uh, it will take years if we start studying and meditating this single chapter. Romans 8 will never be exhausted. There is such a treasure of divine truth in Romans 8. And towards the end of that chapter, when we come to verse 35, right through 39. See, actually verse 35 uh, summarizes us, uh, to us what it really means to. I will read verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? In other words, there is no one, because that... Uh, that that particular passage ends like this. Nor any other created thing, verse 39, will be able to separate us. You can put your name there. You can take it individually. Nothing in this universe, no person, no situation, nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. That's the second thing that must be firmly be established. And uh, certain things to be established, we need to repeatedly tell that in faith to ourselves, each other, encourage one another. That means because we have become sons and daughters of the Most High God, this loving Father, we need not have any condemnation to lead a blessed, victorious life. Second thing is that assurance that nothing can separate me from the love of God. Love of God flows to my life continuously, 24-7. Every moment of my life, that love is unbroken. Maybe my love to him sometimes may uh, decrease 
or sometimes even totally go. But even then, God's word tells us that his love is steadfast. That remains because he is love. Our God is love. And that love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts, as Romans 5, 5 says, through the Holy Spirit which he has given us. Hallelujah. By the Spirit of God, if I have been born again, that love of God also has been poured into my life. I have got a foretaste of heaven. And the love of God which passeth understanding, not only just the peace, the peace passeth understanding, but the more I come to know the Lord and his word, I am amazed what kind of a love this is. This is love divine, love sublime, which no human being can comprehend fully. Hallelujah. But the Lord in his mercy permits us to taste a little bit. Hallelujah. A foretaste of the things to come. In all eternity, we are going to taste and enjoy this love. Hallelujah. We live in a world which is really thirsting for love. People misunderstand the word love. But true love is coming only from God. Because God is love. Human beings have got lesser levels, perverted understandings of love. But here, the word of God, which stands forever, tells me that nothing. See, I will read those uh, a couple of verses. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? That's a question which individually you and I have to answer. Because that has to be personal. You, any preacher can say this, quote these verses, but we have to personally come to see that. There is nothing that can separate me. When that question comes, I must be able to say boldly, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Will tribulation separate me from the love of God? Or distress? We live in a relatively peaceful time. Even if many people do not really have an affinity to God's word or the gospel, but still we are not persecuted. Maybe a little bit like, you know, mosquito bites, nothing more than that. But here even greater persecution may come in the days to come. The country where I was born, India, now some of you may be knowing in northern parts, different parts of the world also, they are suffering persecution because of the gospel, because of Jesus Christ. And some of the brothers here were telling me, the moment you mention Jesus, People just, you know, become indifferent. No, I don't want to hear about, about God. They may be still be tolerant, but some, you know, they don't want to hear even the name of Jesus. And we wonder, you know, that name is so sweet to me. How come it's not sweet to this person? But then the challenge before us then is not to close our heart. To keep that love of God in our heart towards even that person who hates Jesus. Because the one who has changed Jesus hater, Christian hater, soul of Tarsus into Paul, the great apostle, he can change even this person. We must continue with an open heart. Hallelujah. One brother from Europe who visited Bangalore some years back once I still remember, once he told, you know, when he was sharing God's word, he told, you know, about the local church there, maybe some situation he didn't go into all the details, but he said this statement, which is ringing in my ears very often. See, when the hearts of even brothers and sisters in Christ, in some places it can happen, when their hearts become so narrow, closed, cold, the warmth of love gone, when the hearts of many, many become narrow, I find a wide opportunity to enlarge my heart. By the love of God, I can open up my heart to those people who are still closed. Fellowship may not be possible. 
because fellowship is possible only when two hearts open up. But love can remain, and that love can flow. We can pray as the Lord burdens. So that should be the challenge before us, because the love of God has been shed abroad into our hearts, and no one, no situation, no trials, no tribulations, distress, persecution, or famine, or nakedness. Do any of us know about famine? I think our children are overfed. Many of them do not know <laughs> even fasting, one meal, skipping one meal. So, but here, when Paul writes these things, they had this. Praise God that God has given us plenty. But very often, you know, Satan knows when he cannot, you know, make Christians, backslidden Christians through difficulties, he tries to give them plenty. So beware of all material richness beyond a point, you know. The Lord knows what we need, not all that we want, you know. So let us be careful. So peril or sword, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us, 37. And he concludes, for I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate me. Instead of us, I would like to read me. We should take it personally. Will not be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. That's the second thing. That means we should be established in this truth. And the Lord says, I believe it. And when I believe it, I find that it works. Yesterday night we were telling in Brother Sam's house, a small prayer meeting, we were telling, see, the world says seeing is believing. That's the world's philosophy. But then logically, I'm tempted to ask, if you see something, What's the need for me to believe? I'm seeing your brother sitting there with my naked eyes, and I'm telling that I believe you are sitting there. <laughs> that sounds funny, is it not? There's no need for believing something which I see. But the word says, unless they see, they will not believe. But God tells us, believe that I am God. And believe what I say, as Lord Jesus taught, believe in the Father and believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. There's a place by my side, as the Lord told Moses in Exodus. There's a place by his side, which he's preparing for those who love him. Those who are called according to his purpose. Actually, so that assurance should be established. That love can never be broken. That stream of love. So I am a beloved person. One who has been loved. Not because I was worthy, but in his mercy and in his grace, he <coughs> made me worthy. He counted me faithful. See, I very often think, you know, when I get a little discouraged or think that I'm not good enough. See, Paul's one famous statement is he would have read it many times. Paul, while telling his testimony, he says, the Lord God who knew me from my mother's womb, who has chosen me. And then he says, he has counted me faithful and has entrusted this ministry to me. See, usually we tend to think that he will put us under apprenticeship, under training, under observation for some time. And then, when I prove myself to be faithful, then he will enter something to me. That's the normal human way of thinking. Maybe some of you will disagree with me, but God's management system is entirely different. I praise God for that. But in the human system, I worked for a bank, a government bank for about 25 years. I know none will hire a person and just appoint him as the 
uh, the supervisor or the executive on the first day, he will be put under observation. He has to be watched. Yes, in a business establishment, you need to do that. But when God calls a person, gives him a name, loves him and gives him a name, faithful. You call him faithful. God calls me faithful and tells me, gives me uh, a job to do and I'm sure I will do it faithfully. Don't you? See, even little children, parents who are bringing up children knows this. Or if you haven't known this till now, please take it from me. Tell you are growing children, you are good for nothing, they will become good for nothing. Very soon. Even if you pray otherwise. Because you are giving them a bad name. Okay, they may uh, do a little bit of mischiefs and all, that's a part of growing. But if you continuously tell them that you are good for nothing, they will be good for nothing because you are giving that name to them. They are God's gifts to us. So we should give them that assurance that God has sent you into our family. God has given you as a gift to me, a gift to us as parents, because you have tremendous potential for the kingdom of God. And you are going to be a blessing to me as a father. That's how I want to talk to my children. So if we do that, we will also be reflecting God the Father to our children. So Paul says, God counted me faithful. And I am compelled to be faithful. I cannot be unfaithful to him. If God calls you faithful, you must believe that he will help you to be faithful. Praise the Lord. That's why he has given his grace. Don't think that you will fail. You will not make it. Yes, I know. In our own strength, you and I will never make it. But by his grace, by the power of the Spirit, it is possible. So the love of God will never stop flowing. And I know there were times of backsliding in my life when I had closed my heart to this love. Even then later I found out that this love of God poured out from heaven was still knocking at the gates of my heart. That love of God, the goodness of God made me to repent. As in Romans 2, we read, don't you know that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Have you experienced that? The goodness of God. God is good all the time. And sometimes His overwhelming goodness, His graciousness, His mercy, His never-ending love breaks your heart. How come? How come God, in spite of all my unfaithfulness, all my rebellion, all my lack of love for him and an unforgiving heart. How could he still love me? I'm not telling about the time before we came to the Lord, even after coming to the Lord, how many times you and I have fallen. But his love is everlasting. It endures forever. His mercies are new every morning. Hallelujah. Every morning, a fresh day. Hallelujah. So, that's the second thing. And the third thing is a very famous statement, Romans 8, 28. You know that by heart, don't you? God causes all things to work together for good. Because God is good. He cannot do otherwise. <laughs> Hallelujah. If God is love, he cannot but love. The same way our God is good. Therefore, to the ones who have been called according to his purpose. So like I was telling in the first thing, you know, if you are in Christ Jesus, if you are already in Christ Jesus, if you have that assurance, be sure that you have been called according to his eternal purpose. And if you are called according to your eternal purpose, all that you and I need to do 
is to love him with all our heart. Our hearts are so small, it may be opened a little bit only, but in that level, in the present, love God with all your heart. And God is going to expand your heart to love him more. Hallelujah. And if you love him, and if we are called according to this purpose, it is 100% certain. My God who can never lie, he says everything. Even the very thing that is causing you concern now, the things that is burning your heart right now. Believe me, dear sister, dear parent, dear brother, sister, that God is behind the scenes working. Behind the curtain, he is working. Only thing is you do not see his working. Amen. But believe that he is at work. God is at work. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And he reigns. Only thing is I don't see it right now. And seeing is not believing in the kingdom of God. It is believing what God has said. And today or tomorrow I am going to see what I have believed. Hallelujah. Amen. Abraham believed God. Hoping against hope. And it took long years, but he finally saw what he believed. Is it true? The same is going to be true in our lives also. Hallelujah. Everything works together and will work together for my ultimate good. Hallelujah. About that, what is that good? We need, need to get greater and greater revelation from God. Because initially when a person comes to know the Lord, you know, we may have a very limited understanding about what is good. Yes, you know, as parents, we know our little children, some of the children like candies all the time. My son, uh, when he was young, he would have been happy if all the three meals a day, he was given only ice cream, he would have been very happy. <laughs> if no ice cream, he will say, I will scream. He starts screaming. <laughs> But no loving father or mother will feed his children always with the ice cream. So that is the good thing for a child. But as we grow, though it's uh, not easy, we come to understand that you need to eat vegetables also, a balanced <laughs> diet also. It's not that palatable. See, I have got a son. I have three sons, by the way, both the senior. The elder ones are married with kids. And the third one is a latecomer. He is 17 now. Till last year, he was with us. And uh, he was the third late child of his mother, favorite, and uh, <laughs> spoiled. What happened is, you know, he takes, he wants only chicken, mutton, and all these things only. He will never eat vegetables. The only thing he probably will take uh, by the way of vegetables is, some of you would have heard, you know, sambar. That's it. Some of my Indian friends, brothers, will know that sambar. So sambar somehow he liked. So my, my, my wife used to put all vegetables in the sambar and give him. You know, last year, after uh, talking with him and uh, convincing him about his studies, and uh, because at home he will not take studies seriously, so we put him in a hostel in the same town. See, within a month, though it was difficult, he has started liking all kinds of food. <laughs> now, now he says, oh, vegetables are so tasty. <laughs> so that's how, you know, as we grow in Christian life, we will, you know, redefine what is good, what is good. And we will slowly come to understand that what Paul writes here, that ultimate good is to be conformed into the image of his son. Hallelujah. Amen. To be little Christ to be a little Christ. And then, as Jesus told in John, we someday sooner will be able to say with him, with Paul and with others, the one who has seen me has seen Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Because it's not just mere words. By my attitude, by my reflecting the nature of Christ, they will be seeing Christ. Hallelujah. That's why we are called. Praise God. So, everything will work together for our good. So, these th three things, you know, these things. I will not take longer than one hour, though I have so many things to share, but today is not the end of 
everything. So we will wait for tomorrow, but a, a few more things I would like to. I hope up to now I was not boring you. See, uh, here, way back in our country, you know, what happens is uh, by 8.45 or so, even I usually sleep by 10 o'clock, get up early. So if a sermon is too long, then people start showing signs, you know, time to sh stop. <laughs> uh, so uh, Sam was <laughs> joking, telling that I, I do preach for two hours. Sometimes my wife says, you know, you preach too long. Then I'm trying to reduce my preaching time, but never two hours. But uh, usually in the, in the church way back there, when I share God's word, I try to limit myself to half an hour. Because there are other brothers who have the gift of God's word, and I want them to come up. So, so what I was trying to say was these three things must be established in our heart as a beginning. Because... We want to lift up the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross must be an operating instrument in our life, like a surgeon's scalpel, you know, that knife that cuts through. But at the same time, a surgeon's knife is never meant to kill anybody. Because otherwise, some people who need a surgery will never sign those papers, you know, because we believe that he will come through, she will come through the surgery, the cancer removed or the problem removed, cut off. That's what the cross does. And it is God's love that he has allowed us to take up the cross. If only we see the glory in that. Hallelujah. It's not a heavy thing. It's not, see, as... Brother was reading from, we will come to that maybe in another session. I will talk about that at length. Jesus is calling us, come, take up my yoke. It is nothing but our daily cross, taking up the cross daily. And it will not be a burden something. Amen. It will not be. As we know the reality. And he says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. I'm hearing a new interpretation today. Anyway, I am ready to meditate that my burden is light. He has taken it as this light. Travels at the speed of light. <laughs> Maybe that is also true. Because certain things, we, when we approach that, we think it's heavy. It's a burden. But then, at the speed of light, the Lord can open my inner eyes, my spirit's eyes, and show me that it is not a burden. In fact, it is, it is it's such a powerful instrument like a horse, a galloping horse on which I can move forward faster. Because if I don't see that, if the Lord doesn't open my inner eyes to see that, I will be weary under this burden. Cross becomes heavy. So the Lord is going to help us and uh, see... The passage we started uh, at the beginning, it says one thing, you know, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, Paul wanted to know only about, he wanted to preach about Christ who has been crucified. And then he goes on, verse 3, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. So something, I also used to think that when I read Many years back, Paul had a thorn in the flesh, so maybe physical weakness. I don't know. I'm not sure. But whatever it is, that's why he says here, I was in fear and in weakness and in much trembling. It is not at all that thing. He was not having Parkinson's. <laughs> that's why he was trembling. No. This was an inner fear. This was an inner fear. I was in fear and I was trembling and I was weak. What does it mean to be weak? Because when I am strong, God's power cannot flow through me. Paul knew that when, only when I become weak and helpless and cling on to him, then only I become strong because God is demonstrating his power through me. All through history, Christian history, you go through the biography of 
men and women God who, to whom, uh, whom God has used, you will always see that he has used broken vessels. And uh, he still does that thing. He has ch never changed his management style. In the kingdom of God, it's only broken vessels who have known what is suffering, who has known what is weakness. They only have experienced the power of God. So he says, therefore his message and preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of spirit and power. Persuasive words of wisdom cannot convict a sinner. It can never bring brokenness. And actually, see, when we are learned, when we know the word of God, there is always a danger that we may believe, think that, you know, uh, my knowledge of God's word can bring change, transformation in a person. Never. It is God being at work, using broken vessels, brings out the glorious transformation that God wants. So therefore, words of wisdom. So that's why Jesus prayed, as we were reading in the beginning, Matthew 11. Father, I praise you. Worship comes into our heart when we see this divine wisdom. Hallelujah. He hides the divine truths, the pearls of great price. He hides it from the eyes of the wise and intelligent, in the worldly sense. But if you are wise unto salvation, if we are people who have wisdom to see eternal things, see the things that God values, then we are wise before God's eyes. And those who are wise in God's, in the world's view, God hides these things from them and reveals God's mysteries, God's secrets to those who are like little children, willing to take God at his word, never applying their logic in the things that God says. Some of you may ask me, brother, hasn't God given me this intelligent mind? Yes, sure, God has given us that. But the only thing is to use it at the right place. When it comes to taking God at his word, I believe that as a child because it is God who is speaking. He knows. He knows better. He knows what he is speaking. Hallelujah. So therefore, it is not persuasive words of wisdom, but demonstration of spirit and power. And let's pray that in these coming uh, days as we are together and uh, in the days ahead, God will definitely be free to demonstrate his power and strength to us. And therefore... I will just mention just one thing more. So what he says is, why he wants his message not to be in the persuasive words of wisdom? So that, verse 5, your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. And unless and until <coughs> we have a glimpse of the almighty power of God, our faith will be weak. Because about Abraham, we read in Romans 4, when Paul writes about faith, you know, he writes, Abraham did not become weak in faith, but gave glory to God. He had a revelation, in the revelation of who God is. The one who has created everything from nothing by the word of his power. When he said, let it be, let there be light, and there was light. Hallelujah. And he is my God. He is our Father. So, so that our faith should remain in the power of God. What God can do. Not what puny man can do. What God can do. That is the basis of our faith. So then we can start giving glory to God. As I was telling in the beginning, we will start magnifying God. Hallelujah. Through a magnifying glass of faith, Lord, I thank you that you are becoming a little more bigger in my mind's eye. Your love is becoming a little more deeper and stronger. And the patience also, your, your endurance with me, your patience, hallelujah, your long-suffering with me, 
I'm starting to see that a little in a bigger way, in bigger way. And we will glorify the Lord more and more. Praise God. So, so what is what he's trying to say? Your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Verse 6, yet, and that's what we will come to probably see a little more clearly in the, the coming sessions. That means what he says is, we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. That means as we grow, see, as I was telling, when we grow, our definition of what is good, what is good will also change. I remember, you must be remembering that instance when a, a rich young ruler, a very morally upright young man who was rich, who was influential, came to Jesus, knelt before Jesus, and called him good master. You remember that? He called him good master. And his question was, good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life. His seeking was about eternal life. Is it something bad? But Jesus straight away doesn't give him an answer to that. Before that, I don't know, earlier I used to be puzzled, you know, why Jesus is talking like this. Even now, sometimes he puzzles me when I read some of Jesus' statements. Jesus is asking this young man, a zealous young man who has come and knelt before him in great respect and calls him good master. And Jesus tells, why do you call me good? Why do you call me good? What's the next thing he said? Only there is one good person in the whole universe. That is God. Does it mean that Jesus was not God? He was very much God. He never left his, uh, you know, the, that godliness, you know, that second person was very much there. But he took our flesh. See, what Jesus was trying to say was, young man, your understanding of good is very, very limited. You need to know that anything good, really good, can come only from the Father of lights. Only God who is good can make you good. Only God who is eternally good and uh, magnificently good only can impart his goodness to you. All human understanding of goodness comes short of the glory of God, goodness of God. Because we have experienced it many a times. Have you ever tried to be good to your quarreling friend, neighbor, your colleague, or even your life partner? I have tried, and I have miserably failed. Because like the pressure cooker, you know, when the pressure is too strong, the safety valve just flies, you know. Eh? So beyond a point, we cannot be good. Our goodness ends there. But if it's God's goodness, immense, vast, beyond human understanding, that will continue to flow. Hallelujah. Because it's not I that do good. I do not know to do good. That's what Paul found out. But God, who is working and speaking and doing his thing through me, can always be good. He can always be loving. He can always be patient. So the thing for us is just very simple. Let me tell a statement. Probably some of you may be a little shocked about that. No one can live the Christian life. Then why have we come for this conference? I haven't finished my sentence. No one can live the Christian life but Jesus Christ. He alone can live the Christian life. That's why Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 towards the end, I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ liveth through me. Only Christ can live the Christian life through any one of you. Even with me, the same is true. The life, the very life that I now live, I live by the faith in the Son of God. Faith of the Son of God is also true. Hallelujah. Who died for me. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's give glory to his name. And uh, that wisdom, about that wisdom we will talk later. And that is a kind of mystery, hidden wisdom, 
which God predestined before the ages to our glory. There is something. It is no more a secret, but it will remain a secret to those who do not fear God. Because in 1 Sam, that verse is familiar to you, I believe. It is written, God reveals his secrets to those who fear him. Am I right? God shares his secret, that is mysteries, not with everyone, but with those who fear God, reverence him inside, you know, has a real reverential fear of him. Not that scary fear that God may just catch me by the neck and put me in hell, not like that, but he is my father. I want to honor him. I fear him because I love him. Hallelujah. I am scared that sometimes I may cause him pain. I may cause him grief. That should be our fear. And if you fear that, he will reveal his secrets to us. He will share his secrets with us. And one of the secrets is the glory that has been destined for those who have been called according to his purpose. And believe that you are in that list. Hallelujah. You are in that list. I praise God because he has chosen me to be like Jesus. That's our calling. Let's give glory to the Lord. May his name be magnified. Thank you for listening. Thank you.